Hi, my name is Shane. I run the events over at 10 Capital Network. Uh, we have a, another great session for you today on how to invest in vertical SaaS with our great uh, speaker, Martin Tobias from Incisive Ventures. Uh, if you have any questions during the session, I'm going to go ahead and unlock the chat right now. So uh, please feel free to post your questions there throughout the session. We'll do our best to get to them. Uh, and with that, I'm going to go ahead and pass it off to our CEO, Hall Martin, to get us introduced. Great. Well, thanks, Shane. And uh, thank you guys for joining us today. We have a great presentation from Martin Tobias of Incisive Ventures on how to invest in vertical SaaS. I found this a topic that is increasingly coming up in discussions I'm having in angel groups and VC funds is, especially around AI, how do you handle that? And vertical SaaS seems to be where I see a lot of people going with this. And so glad to have Martin coming in today to talk about this topic and tell us more about it. Uh, just before we kick into the slides, Martin, can you tell us more about yourself and your firm? Uh, yeah, hi, I'm Martin, and uh, I started uh, Incisive Ventures. We're a $10 million pre-seed fund uh, in Seattle. I've been investing uh, as an angel for about 20 years, and um, I recently raised uh, a fund. Um, I invest in things that I say reduce friction at scale, and a lot of that's vertical market software, and I'll uh, get into that, but I've really enjoyed the community here, and I'm looking forward to talking to everybody. Great. And so one question before we kick into your slides is, how do you decide what sectors to invest in? What drives your, your thought process there? Well, um, one thing I did um, when the pandemic started is uh, I took three months and I looked back at all the 200 companies I'd invested in till then. And I tried to figure out where I uh, had an advantage and where I sort of knew something. And I came up with this thesis of technology that reduces friction at scale by looking at, you know, where I really helped companies and where I had an insight into a market. So I think your thesis comes from looking at your personal network looking at your at, at what, what your prior work experience is and um, deciding where you can add the most value as an investor. For example, uh, I have made money investing in crypto companies, but I am not embedded in the crypto universe. And therefore, in my new fund, I'm not investing in crypto because I'm just simply not the best investor for crypto, regardless of whether they might be good companies. So I, I personally believe that investors should come up with a thesis that is highly correlated to uh, their prior work experience and where their network is, because that's are gonna, those are going to be the assets that are going to help your investments uh, get follow-on financing, get business development done, and stuff like that. And uh, investors really need to be more than uh, just money. They need to uh, deliver some value, and you should be investing in things where you can deliver value. Great. Well, let's go ahead and jump into your presentation about how to invest in vertical SaaS. And for if you can go ahead and launch your slides and kick off those in the audience, uh, feel free to post your questions. When we get finished with the presentation, we'll come back and pick those questions up and go from there. With Mart that, Martin, go ahead and kick off. Okay, thanks. Uh, well, I already talked about some of this. Uh, I'm Martin Tobias, $10 million pre-seed fund. Um, I've been investing in this thesis, which is technology companies that reduce friction at scale for about four years, about 70 companies, four unicorns, about two and a half billion in follow on financing. And I define friction as complexity between us and what we want. And I'll get into how that specifically um, displays itself in a vertical market software. A little more about me. I talked a little bit uh, about this. Uh, I've been an investor for a long time. I've also been a 25-year entrepreneur. I was backed three times by venture capitalists. Two of my companies went public. I raised over $500 million. Way back in the day, I was at Microsoft and Accenture. And I've also been on the other side of the equation um, as an LP in uh, venture funds. So I'm an LP, a GP, and an entrepreneur. <laughs> um, one of the things that I put together when I started investing more full time was I mentioned that process that I went and spent three months looking at all my investments. And I came up with these seven themes that were there had to be at least five of these seven themes in each company that turned out to be very successful out of those 200 investments. And you might have heard of some of these before, you know, software eats everything. So I don't invest in uh, hardware companies. I don't invest in biotech. Um, you know, great founders figure stuff out. I mean, uh, when you're investing pre-seed like me, um, you know, it's really all about the founder. 
Um, I also like to invest in companies that create new markets as opposed to uh, red oceans, um, creates new categories. For example, I was an early investor in DocuSign, and DocuSign was one of the first companies to do this digital signature. They actually created a whole category. And when you do create a category, that um, gets to be a lot more uh, valuable. And it turns out that, you know, some companies, if they do it correctly, can turn into a platform. And that was one of the, uh, and those can be incredibly more valuable than individual applications. And that was what happened, for example, with DocuSign. One of the challenges early in that company was they said, hey, signing things on your phone, that seems pretty easy technology. Adobe could copy that in like five minutes. Like, how does this become a protectable company? But what they did is put a whole bunch of workflow around it where signing order and sending things around to different people and integrations to legal document management systems. And they turned that feature into a platform and that became like 100 times more valuable than, than, than that. Um, anyway, my favorite uh, meta theme is laziness wins. I remember um, I uh, was looking at investing in the Starbucks IPO. I called a friend of mine at the time. I said, should I invest in Starbucks? And he said, they're selling a legal addictive drug <laughs> and for you know 90% more than you can make at home. Yes, of course you should do it. Why do people buy coffee at Starbucks? Because it's convenience, it's brand. It's it, You can, in some cases, charge an incredible premium to enable people's laziness, which is they don't feel like making a latte at home. So those are just some of my meta themes. Happy to take questions on that. Let's go into vertical market software. So what is vertical market software? It's um, software that's developed and customized for a specific industry application or audience with specific needs. And so um, this is part of, it's a lot of people are talking about vertical market software today, but it's part of a longer term trend in that when people um, you know, the first develop uh, computer technologies did develop very generalized applications like Excel that could do lots of things. And what happens is people did lots of things with Excel. And now what you've got is people using Excel to do to uh, uh, do specific business purposes that could that and also integrate with like 10 other applications. And they've got all these duct tape general purpose applications solving a specific need. Uh, let's say, you know, um, you know, tracking fixed assets or something like that. And uh, today with cloud AI and all of these other no code solutions, it turns out you can create a specific solution to solve that asset problem cheaper and, you know, do it faster and with less friction than using a repurposing a general tool like Excel. And so that's um, the, what vertical market software is, is, and, I, and it's becoming more enabled every year as you have these new no-code tools, cloud and AI, that allow you to build these applications in order of magnitude uh, faster. Um, and so that's kind of what vertical market software is. You know, how big is the market? Um, one of the guys said that, you know, it's about $120 billion market in 2022, growing to over $400 billion. Um, and that includes all sorts of things. Some of the, whoops, that's not the right one. What are some of the trends that are driving uh, adoption of vertical market software? Um, the tailwinds are like horizontal tool complexity. Like I just invested in this company called Portside. I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, they were doing a vertical market software for private airplane owners. And in order to operate a private airplane, to track the maintenance schedule of that, to book um, customers, to file flight plans with the FAA, they were had cobbled together like 10 different applications, Excel, PDF files, uh, text message applications, um, you know, all sorts of things. And they were all general horizontal tools that they had applied specifically to this problem. Um, and uh, so what we have now is uh, people using a bunch of different horizontal tools together to try to achieve one business objective. And that complexity is driving people to look for an integrated solution. And that, as I mentioned, a lot of duct tape. And one of the positive tailwinds is that today there's a lot of low cl code cloud type infrastructure that allows you to uh, develop and deploy applications in order of magnitude faster. And I think the next 
tailwind that's going to help vertical market software is AI and ML everything. You know, um, I'm really excited to be a pre-seed investor in 2023 because when I give somebody, say, $500,000, that $500,000, because of co-pilot uh, software developments, things with AI and things like that, is going to go farther than it did even just a year ago because the developers can be so much more uh, productive. And um, the last tailwind is just the focus on uh, productivity and efficiency. Um, you know, I think people were kind of until the middle of last year involved, interested in growth at all cost. And today there was an interesting tweet um, I saw online uh, today that a guy talked to three CFOs and they said, if your software doesn't reduce my expenses, uh, I have zero budget for it. And um, so there is an incredible cost consciousness right now. And if you can take sort of five or 10 tools, simplify them into one tool at a lower total cost in a vertical market software, that's going to be something enterprises would be interested in buying uh, today, much more so even than they were a little while ago. And some of the uh, sectors that I think are particularly interesting for vertical market software tend to be the older, like lagging technology sectors, or like, for example, in healthcare companies, you know, healthcare was an early adopter of IT, but many of them adopted things sort of 20, 30 years ago and are now operating on incredibly old legacy systems. So these industries like healthcare and fitness and fintech and insurance and real estate and supply chain that are generally laggards in terms of IT uh, uh, penetration are perfect uh, markets for vertical market software because many of them are using spreadsheets and word processors and things like that. For example, in supply chain, I just did a company that's doing... Um, uh, customs clearance processing. And the normal customs clearance processing today is somebody gets an email with a PDF file with a bill of lading. They open a separate window and they open the customs clearance document. And then they manually transcribe from the bill of lading into the application. A person is actually doing this. This is 2023. And this company wrote a vertical market software that used optical character recognition, AI to map, do field mapping, and it can transcribe that bill of lading into the uh, customs clearance application at a higher accuracy rate than a human can, and at one-tenth the labor cost. That's using some modern technology to replace a prior manual process at one-tenth the cost. Those are the kind of vertical market uh, software opportunities that I'm super excited about. So what are some examples of vertical market software? Um, these are all different categories. You see that in construction and car repair, um, you know, companies like ShopMonkey, um, making it easier to book um, um, your car getting fixed. You have things in healthcare, in uh, gym fitness, in real estate. I use that company Appfolio, which is uh, for managing commercial uh, real estate properties and all of the um, tickets of getting things fixed in your rental property and doing statements and things like that. Again, a company like Appfolio um, is specific to the real estate, but they replaced like um, QuickBooks and Excel spreadsheets, which is how people used to manage their real estate portfolios. So these are just some examples of companies in uh, vertical market software in different industries. And uh, what are some vertical market software investments that I have made uh, at Incisive Ventures? Let me just go through a few of them. I mentioned this one already, Portside. It's a uh, software for management and scheduling of private airplanes. So they wrote a vertical market software that um, cr creates a maintenance schedule for a private airplane, allows um, cus pay, um, allows people that are flying on the planes to book a seat. And in the past, private airplanes, um, you know, you had to be texting basically with the pilot to find out when the plane was going to leave. And you had to PDF like fax a, um, a, a weight and balance thing, uh, telling them how much you weighed and where you were going to sit on the plane so they could file that with the FDA. There was just a ton of manual processes and Portside has um, a, a platform that does that. They now have 
uh, companies like NetJets using their platform. Uh, they have about 7,000 airplanes on their platform. They're growing about 300% year over year, and they've been profitable for the last uh, two years. Um, Hyphen SCS is warehouse management software for India. So for mid-sized warehouses, there's approximately a million warehouses in India that are 30,000 square feet or less, and nobody owns more than two of them. So an incredibly fragmented market. That's another uh, place that's very good for vertical market software is fragmented markets. And um, so they, um, uh, and part of the problem of uh, for brands when they wanted to book warehouse space in India is that they had to go through local brokers. And if you were a brand and you wanted warehouse space in seven cities, you had to talk to like 20 different people, very expensive commissions anyway. They wrote some software that they gave to for free to these warehouses, and then they got listed on their directory. There was no central directory even for warehouse space that was available for rent across all of India. They created the first one. They created some software so brands can book warehouse space in, in multiple cities, and they can do that booking at cheaper than a, 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 a normal um, local agent could do. So they took um, discovery friction, booking friction, and cost friction out of the warehouse space market in India. Another one I closed just um, last week was Uptime Health. And um, if you're running a, a large medical system, you probably have a fixed asset manager that keeps track of how many centrifuges you have and x-ray machines and all your different medical equipment, knows the schedule of maintenance for that equipment and replacement and uh, fixing of filters and things like that. If you are in an outpatient clinic, like an outpatient surgery center or a dental clinic or any of these uh, emergency care facilities, you probably don't have a, a person doing that. And this uh, company created a, a software platform that manages those fixed assets in outpatient clinics. And they have an associated service marketplace where you can get uh, service calls done on that uh, hardware as well. Um, they're growing, they did about $2 million this year. They're profitable. They're growing very quickly and they're being pulled into the market because these people that operate these outpatient clinics know they have to, um, track and maintain their fixed assets and they have no system to do that. Um, another company that I did was, uh, we stock, which is a first party data system for consumer package goods brands. And basically what they saw was a ton of, uh, CPG brands selling direct on their websites for the first five or $10 million of revenue, some new product like a new hemp CBD thing or something. And eventually they want to go into retail and um, uh, do things like get their e-commerce customers to go into Whole Foods to buy their product. And this, uh, and WeStock operates a platform that enables um, e-commerce brands to drive um, customers into their new retail channels. And um, that's in the past, they used to have to use downloads to uh, MailChimp and integration to text message platforms and lots of spreadsheets. Anyway, they created a specific software to do this. They've got about 150 brands on it. And it's growing about 30% uh, month over month. Um, Two months ago, I just did this company called Aristotle HQ, and this gets to something you were talking about, Hall, um, which is it's generative AI for cold outbound email. And they are targeting uh, founder-led B2B uh, SaaS software companies, and they have some uh, scripts that um, do research on uh, potential prospects and then uh, do personalized emails. Basically, normal cold emails from for SaaS software companies get opened about one or two percent of the time. This company, with a combination of new generative AI technologies and research uh, tools, is getting about a seventeen percent open rate and and uh, meeting rate for their cold emails just by integrating um, some of the generative AI stuff um, to 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 do better cold outbound emails. But they're solving a specific problem, which is how does the founder of a SaaS software startup company get more meetings? And uh, that was a formerly a, a very difficult process to do. Uh, the last one I'll talk about is I did this company called Instamed, which is e-pharmacy software for independent pharmacies in India. There were lots of companies 
that were trying to create e-pharmacy brands in India and get consumers to buy from them and then shipping through the mail. What this company said is, you know, um, people already have pharmaceutical relationships with their local corner pharmacy. Why don't we write software that enables that corner pharmacy to be in the e-pharmacy business, have an app, be able to do uh, ordering online, get bulk discounts and things like that. So they wrote software that enabled the local pharmacy to be in the e-commerce business and people can pick up their um, prescriptions at the local pharmacy and you save that shipping. Anyway, um, they have a couple hundred pharmacies on their platform now, and they're growing very quickly because they are software, vertical market software that enables an existing retailer to be in the e-commerce business, as opposed to trying to compete with that local pharmacy with an online only business. So that's another part of vertical market software that I like is people that are writing software, which enables uh, people to extend into e-commerce as opposed to trying to create a competitive brand. Um, so let's talk about some of the key components of vertical market software. Uh, this is what I'm looking for, for a good opportunity for vertical market software. Number one, lots of legacy processes with manual uh, steps. You know, at port side, they literally used to have to fax a PDF file to the FAA every time they flew an airplane. And um, it was, you know, in 2023. And now they can do all that. Uh, electronically. Um, if you see lots of uh, horizontal tools being used to build a workflow, like, you know, Excel cobbled together with QuickBooks together with, you know, some SMS platform, lots of complex integrations uh, that break very easily. That's a good uh, place to build a, a vertical market software. Um, when you're talking about as an investor, what do you uh, look for for uh, funding a company that might build vertical market? The most important thing I look for is deep founder market fit, because these companies are not necessarily about the hard technology because you're usually usually the software is not that hard to make. For example, the software in um, a hyphen SCS creating a directory of warehouse space in India, that was not a hard technical technological problem. But the founder um, was a former supply chain manager at Flexport, and he knew hundreds of owners of warehouses. So he knew the people to get into the market. So that was incredible founder market fit. These vertical market softwares are more about having the founder understand the market. At Portside, the founder had created a prior software company for private airplanes that got sold for a very good thing, and he knew the owners of net jets. He knew the owners of, you know, hundreds of airplanes. And so it was his industry connections in that specific vertical that got him the um, business for his software company, as opposed to necessarily the technology invention. So I always look for incredibly deep founder market fit for a vertical market software. The other thing that you need to do, um, you need to provide a 10x better process improvement with a vertical market software. If you're only improving a business process by 5 or 10%, it's not going to be enough to get somebody to change um, the way they do things because of company uh, inertia. In that uh, bill of lading um, customs clearance thing, they were reducing the labor required to do a customs clearance by 90%. And customs clearance is a fixed price business. Therefore, all of that uh, additional cost savings drops to the bottom line of the freight forwarder. And that huge amount of ROI is what gets people to um, pull your solution into their company as opposed to necessarily having to sell them over a long period of time. You got to have a pretty short term payback and a well documented uh, uh, ROI to get people to change the way they've been doing things for years. And um, another really important thing if a, for a very early vertical market software is to have early adopters really early in development, basically co-developing things. So for example, with uh, Aristotle HQ, their first five customers you know, were in a Slack channel and they were in basically daily communication with them to build this vertical market software. The key to building great vertical market software is you really have to understand what your customers want. So if you can get a few of them to co-develop the first version of the product with you um, to specifically meet the way they run their business, you're going to have a much better 
uh, chance of, of making it work for uh, lots of other uh, people as well. Um, so those are my thoughts on vertical market uh, software and some of the investments that I've done. Uh, and I'd love to talk to anybody about uh, questions about that. I have some questions to kick it off and those in the audience can feel free to jump in with uh, questions in the chat box. My, my first question is, are you finding the vertical SaaS platforms lower cost to build than horizontal platforms? And if so, by how much? Uh, yes, very much so, um, because you're building to solve a specific problem as opposed to trying to have a generalized tool that can solve a whole bunch of edge cases. So you typically have a very clear set of uh, requirements for your uh, MVP. I, I don't know if I, I don't know how to quantify um, like what percent uh, cheaper it is. The, the big difference is that they're faster to develop. Um, you know, you can write, uh, Aristotle wrote the initial version of their uh, cold outbound email thing in two months. And, you know, it took OpenAI five years to launch ChatGPT. <laughs> well, that's great. Well, would, is the tech stack different or smaller or easier to build compared to, uh, you know, general SaaS out there. What what do you think is the difference between the two on building the tech stack? Uh, you 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 build you use basically the same uh, tech stack. Um, you know, you might use uh, a, a few more uh, APIs uh, to integrate things, um, but it's the same as building a a general purpose uh, thing. I think it's it's very similar. Yeah. And my last one, and then we'll jump to the audience, is, is what kind of fundraising differential are you seeing here? Can I raise less money and get to where I want to go on vertical SaaS that more easily than if I have a full SaaS platform? What, what's the difference on the fundraising requirements in, in your mind? Well, I don't know about requirements. Um, I mean, I get, maybe I'll talk more about the uh, environment. Personally, because I love vertical market SaaS, and I think more, you know, investors are starting to, to think this way. One of the good things about vertical market SaaS is that typically you're going to have a very clear set of customers and the CEO probably already knows them. You're going to have a much clearer market entry strategy. If you're creating a general purpose tool um, you, that, that doesn't have a specific use case with a specific ROI, you have to do a whole bunch of marketing and try all different messaging and try to get people to understand what the hell it is you're doing. With a vertical market SaaS, like with, you know, you're, you're usually solving a very specific problem with a known set of customers that have that problem. You've got a few of them already uh, involved. So it, you can raise less money because you've got a more direct um, path to market. Um, and, you know, for example, like with um, Aristotle HQ, um, after two months, they had uh, five customers and $7,500 in revenue, monthly recurring revenue. And this is after two months in business because they were solving a very specific problem for a very specific set of customers who really needed it. <laughs> so um, the thing I like about vertical market SaaS is that you have a much sharper focus on how you're going to get to market and how much money it's going to take because you're engaging directly with customers with a specific problem. Great. Well, the first question from the audience is, what are the current valuations that you are investing in for SaaS platforms in the pre-seed space relative to two years ago? And what revenue level is your sweet spot? <laughs> That's a good uh, question. Uh, I posted something on my blog. If you go to incisive.vc, I posted a post about um, the four stages, uh, um, angel, pre-seed, seed, and the numbers associated with them. But um, basically what the way I define pre-seed, and some people conflate angel to pre-seed, I define angel as that first $500,000 you might raise at probably less than $5 million valuation, where you have an idea and you need to build the MVP. I define pre-seed as you've got an MVP, you've been in the market for three or four months, making some amount of revenue, you've got some customer engagement, and you're raising between 500,000 and a million and a half. And basically, I made 65 investments in that pre-seed range prior to November of last year. My average valuation was $10 million. 
Since November of last year, I've made six investments. My average valuation is $4.5 million for that same stage. And so I've seen pre-seed valuations come down about 50%. And that's about the same. It's actually gone down more like 80% in stages C and D. Uh, but in pre-seed, we are back to what I consider sort of traditional uh, valuations. Basically, you know, the end of last year was the end of basically a 12-year bull run in venture capital that at the end got kind of crazy with, you know, some YC companies raising at a $20 million valuation before they even finished their product. I never participated in those rounds, and I'm glad that we're no longer um, in that hype phase of the market, even though we are seeing some of that in the new poster child, which is AI. <laughs> Great. Well, I believe you answered the next question, which is, what is your difference between pre-seed and seed? I think you discussed that. If you want to add more to that, that's fine. Yeah, I didn't mention the difference between seed. So I define pre-seed as you've got a little bit of revenue, maybe five or $10,000 a month. You got a few customers, and really, what you're trying to do is uh, uh, verify product market fit and get a few more customers to verify what features you have to build. I'm seeing seed rounds happen today once you've reached three to five hundred thousand dollars of ARR. So in pre-seed, you're underwriting the risk, uh, the growth of revenue from maybe you know. 20 or 30,000 ARR up to 300 or 500,000 ARR where the seed funds start to get interested. Um, seed valuations are, so, so pre-seed valuations are less than $10 million typically, even though my valuation was like four and a half. And um, seed valuations are coming in basically less than $25 million. The average seed valuation is now coming in around $15 million. But in order to get that valuation, you need to be at four, five, six hundred thousand dollars of ARR. And um, to do a Series A, your Series A's are happening at about two million dollars of ARR. And all of those levels of revenue are basically double what they were a year ago. So a year ago, you could get a seed round done at 200,000 ARR, it's now 400. You could get an A done at a million dollars ARR, it's now two million. So um, the traction at each level has gone up by basically 2x, while the valuations have stayed roughly the same. Great. Next question is, what's a good market size and structure for a vertical SaaS? Uh, the market size has to be at least a billion dollars. You're not going to probably get into trillion dollar uh, market sizes in vertical SaaS. Um, but it needs to be at least a billion dollars. I saw one the other day that was, you know, estimated to be a hundred million dollars. Um, it that's still not big enough because basically, even even in vertical SaaS, you still um, the the power law applies, and you still, as an investor, have to get yourself comfortable that you you know you see a path to a hundred million dollars in revenue. And if you have a $100 million market size, there's really no path for a single company to get to $100 million in revenue. <laughs> That's great. Okay. My, my other question is we get more coming in from the uh, window is, what is the difference in exits between a vertical SaaS and a, a, a full SaaS uh, business? Or do you see any difference at all? Uh, I haven't seen too many uh, exits. Um, you know, comparing those two, that would be good information to know. I mean, I would say that it's not an either or, um, you know, I, I, I would say things like, I mean, even certain marketplaces are, you know, becoming, um, you know, vertical market uh, software. It's like, you know, Airbnb, um, you could call that vertical market software because they're doing a specific thing. Uh, and, and you're seeing this in marketplaces a lot. You're seeing the general marketplaces like Amazon and eBay getting competition from specific vertical marketplaces in sort of auto parts and, you know, uh, baby goods. And I've seen them in teen uh, stuff. And so, you know, you, you see this verticalization, you know, against general things happening in e-commerce as well mm -hmm. as uh, software. I don't, uh, I haven't looked at the multiples of those um, you know, verticals versus the generals. 
generally the the generals you would think have a larger total addressable market and would get a premium on the the multiples um but the thing i love about vertical market software and why they sometimes get a i certainly give a premium in the early stages is because vertical market software can typically grow faster than general purpose uh software uh, because they're solving a specific problem targeted at a specific set of customers who really need that uh, product. So uh, in the early stages, I would expect the multiples to be slightly higher for vertical market software companies. Okay. Well, typically we've been encouraging people not to make single products, but rather platforms, platforms that can do more. Do plat does that concept still apply to the vertical market space? Yes, it does. Um, and, you know, for example, I just... Um, you know, so uh, like that company I did that does the customs clearance, they identified one particular problem uh, for uh, customs clearance for freight forwarders, but those freight forwarders do 10 things during the day. That's just one of the 10 things that they do. So you always have to have what I call a thin edge of the wedge, which is the first thing that you're doing. Uh, that solves somebody, uh, ma makes a, pro a problem go away for a person. And then hopefully you understand that person's work day and then you add other things onto your platform that can make it uh, better. I mean, you're not going to end up being a general uh, platform, you know, like a Slack, but you can certainly land and uh, expand. Um, I, one of the companies that I... Um, invested in. It's not exactly, well, it's not, it's not vertical market software, so I won't talk about it, but, um, but Portside is vertical market software. And one of the things they did, their, their first product was simply um, maintenance scheduling for airplanes. And then they got into passenger scheduling after that. And then they got into FAA flight plan uh, filing because after they did patient, uh, passenger things, right? So they kept expanding and they have, I think, a 120% net revenue retention. What that means is that they sell a module to the that solves a specific problem to a company today. And then they add other modules over time and they and the company expands the modules that they're using over time so that their total revenue from that one customer goes up over time. So I agree that you hopefully are going to have a vertical market software that solves multiple problems, but you always, when you're starting, have to solve one problem that's a big enough pain point that people will pay you for it and that you do it 10 times better. Maybe not every module is 10 times better, but at least that first one has to be 10 times better than the way they're doing it now. Great. Well, the next question from the audience is, what is your preferred investment vehicle, convertible note or straight equity? And what are your thoughts on convertible note caps? Um, well, I, I was uh, on Twitter uh, complaining or, or thankfully uh, glad that the safe note is starting to disappear and it's converting to uh, convertible notes. I prefer to do convertible notes. Uh, in the pre-seed, you're almost always doing either a convertible note or a safe note. I personally prefer a convertible note, basically because it's a little more investor friendly and you're actually debt uh, to the company as opposed to a safe note. You also have some rights of the ability to um, approve how much more notes they issue, whereas safe notes companies can typically issue as much as they want. And one of the main problems I've seen in pre-seed uh, that's come to fruition over the last year or so is companies with a giant amount of safe notes, so much so that it's hard to ever do a price drown because they have seven, eight, ten million dollars of safe notes. Um, I recommend that people don't raise any kind of convertible securities, whether it's a safe or a convertible note, more than maybe 30, 40 percent of how much you expect to raise when you do a price drown. Um, when you have two or three X the amount of convertible debt that you are raising in a price round, it makes it very, very difficult for that investor to write the price round. And I've seen more than one company get screwed uh, on that. As far as caps, um, you know, um, it, it it is what whatever, you know, are comparables going on uh, right now. Um, the more important thing uh, for me in this market, because it's hard to know 
what the valuations are. And the reason people use these convertible things is because you don't have enough traction to price anything yet. So the cap, you know, is kind of a finger in the air, but I'm always doing a cap and a discount. Um, and I'm primarily betting that the discount is what's going to uh, apply uh, because, um, you know, you want to get, make sure that if you invest early and the, they raise around six months from now, you get a discount to that round. And so it's usually, I always go for a 20% uh, discount, uh, regardless of what the cap is. I'm, I'm not as concerned about the cap in, in this environment because it's kind of a finger in the air uh, thing anyway. But I have seen caps coming down. I, I, was, uh, I in, was talking to a company last week that wanted to raise at a 10 cap pre-product um, with no revenue. And I said, that sounds a little rich. And the very next day they came back and said, how about a six cap? Um, and that's about more what is happening for a pre-product company is a mid single digit cap rate. Great. Another question from the audience is how often are your vertical founders not from the industry they are creating for? Are they relying on others experience and feedback to build? Um, I would be unlikely to fund a vertical market software company without a CEO from the industry. Uh, I have seen it. Um, you know, I, I've seen some people try to do that. The, the problem is that the key to these vertical market software companies is you've got to understand the industry. You've got to know the customers. You've got to get those first 10 customers with personal relationships. If you just read in a Gartner report that some vertical market software was going to be interesting and you decided to start a company there and you didn't know anybody in that industry, that would be terrible. Um, I did a company um, that uh, is creating a uh, construction uh, uh, messaging platform for field construction workers, like plumbers and framers and stuff like that. It's kind of like Slack, but for field construction workers. The guy who started it was a 10-year general contractor. And he had written the first version of the tool himself as an internal tool for his own construction company because this was he was solving a personal problem, which was labor productivity on the job site. And he was taking that 10 years of development uh, experience, plus he knew hundreds of contractors and uh, generalizing the tool internal tool that he built to sell to other contractors. He already had like the first 20 customers in the bag because they were his friends. That's the kind of founder you really need in a um, um, in a vertical market software. It was much more important to me that that guy came from the industry than necessarily he was a technical founder. Vertical market software founders tend to be industry specific uh, experts, not technical founders. Right. Well, my last question, and if anybody in the audience has one, now's the time to post it before we finish is do you see a lot of deep tech uh, applications for vertical market SaaS? Um, I don't really, uh, because typically, you know, these are not tech heavy companies. These are, um, you're solving a business problem. And um, so, you know, there's not a lot of deep tech in uh, vertical market uh, software companies. Um, they're, they're, they're fairly easy uh, to write. And that's why the, the, the balance needs to be on the uh, industry experience. Great. Well, I want to thank you for that. And looking forward to your feedback on our upcoming deal. We do have a vertical SaaS uh, deal coming up here. For those in the audience, if you'd like to learn more about Insights Adventures, we have a poll going through now. And with that, I'd like to introduce Matt Smentick of Unchained Systems. Matt, if you can go ahead and show your slides and looking forward to Martin's feedback on this deal as how it might fit as a vertical SaaS deal. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Hall, and thank you, uh, Martin. Um, can everyone see my screen okay? Uh, yes, we can. All right. So I'm Matt. I'm co-founder of Unchained Systems, where we've combined our expertise in the grooming business and software product development solve the issues that are inhibiting the personal services industry. Our mission is to empower personal services businesses to thrive. And my wife and I are multi-unit franchisee owners of Diesel Barbershop in Austin, Texas. My co-founder of Unchained Systems is Shane Brown, and he is the founder of Diesel Barbershop and Henley's Men's Grooming. The problem that we're trying to tackle, well, there's multiple. So the first is a customer experience for a 
online call-in or walk-in appointment is antiquated. Booking a simple appointment can be up to 29 clicks or data inputs. So that's a lot of friction. It's one of the items we just talked about, eliminating friction. Um, we're expecting a 24 by seven digital booking solution with a modern UI that works, not getting that. Owners and managers need one tool for reporting, analytics, scheduling, labor management. Specifically, there's not a world-class platform for franchisors and multi-store owners. While there's been major advances in FinTech and delivery and restaurant, personal services category has been neglected. <clears throat> the stakeholders are underwhelmed. So customers need a more efficient, personalized omni-channel booking system, online call-in, walk-in, chat, SMS. Uh, employees want more facts on customer needs to meet and see, exceed expectations uh, and opportunities to earn more income. Store managers need tools to help schedule and manage their team and store. The store owners need tools to help run a profitable operation, attracting and retaining customers and staff and managing payroll. And franchisors need brand consistency, robust reporting, data and analytics, and royalty management tools. So the solution is called Amplify by Unchained Systems. It's a superior digital experience for personal services patrons a better work experience for the employees in the stores, superior store owner results leading to more profitable growth, and increased franchisor capabilities to control brand consistency to profitably grow the brand. This is our ecosystem. It, at its heart, it's a purpose-built point of sale and customer relationship management system with individual vertical SaaS modules. So a few call outs. First of all, a lot of times today, the brand website and the booking website for these franchisors, franchisees, and multi-store owners is disjointed. And so if you think about what Squarespace has done and applying that to a franchisor and franchisee model, tying that to a full CRM and POS is really what we're talking about here. Quick and easy booking, think about what OpenTable and Resi has done for restaurant booking. And quick and easy customer checkout, inventory management, and scheduling. So think about what Toast has done or the restaurant category. This is an operating system for franchisors, franchisees, and multi-store owners. Here's a quick summary of where we are. We've got about 60% of the core capabilities live and running in one production store with many more features to come. Um, some early results, we just turned on online booking in January. Uh, we were able to have walk-in and call-in customers, but just turned on online booking. And already we're seeing some really positive results in the test store. So in February, we saw 61 first-time customers. This is by reducing the amount of clicks, increasing the synergies between the brand website and the booking website. So it looks like one organization um, and generally just reducing the friction. In terms of ad spend, so we have full Google ads integration to measure performance, which a lot of these SMB companies don't really have a way to manage and measure their marketing spend. Um, and what we're seeing here is the ad spend per customer acquisition coming down in the first three months. If you look at the total addressable market based on Ibis World, the total number of hair and nail, hair and nail establishments in the US times our fee per month, that's a $7 billion uh, industry. Our service addressable market specifically focused on franchise brands and hair and nails. It's 400 million. And at 3% of the market, which is our anticipated growth by 2020 15, on a conservative side, it's a $40 million business. Our first customer is us. So, my co founder, again, is the um, owner of uh, Diesel Barbershop, Henley's Men's Grooming, and Cowboy Up. Um, these are three brands consisting of 32 open stores right now. There's six stores in the construction process. And Shane, uh, my co-founder, has sold licenses for Diesel Barbershop at 115 locations scheduled to open by 2027. He's about to start franchising uh, one of his other brands, Henley's, in the next uh, two months. Our second customer is Premier Cuts. They've been in business for 18 years, five locations in Central Texas, has also used a myriad of systems and is not satisfied with what's on the market. And that brings our total store count to 43 without any sales and marketing. So very similar to what we just talked about, really working deeply with industry experts 
uh, to craft our solution. Our go-to-market strategy is to bring people in on our core SaaS product. And similar to what Martin talked about, you get them in for core SaaS and then you land and expand into additional capabilities. So my wife, for example, spends six to eight hours a month doing scheduling. Uh, I see a, a scenario very shortly where we've got a digital co-pilot that allows automation to get that down to like 15 minutes. Uh, similarly, labor management, once you are uh, got your schedule done for the day, you're 2 p.m., you close at 8 p.m., how many bookings have you had same day between these hours, you know, day over day, month over month, and should I add labor, cut labor, maintain labor, um, because that's the number one variable expense. You can use data and analytics to help you optimize for your uh, business. And then lastly, extending through the value chain. So we see a scenario once we have a lot of the rich data to work with financial institutions and get a finder's fee for offering things like same-day loan, uh, same-day payouts, payday loans, uh, bridge loans for owners, and ultimately financing some of the franchisees. Uh, our current business model is SaaS plus FinTech. So our core SaaS solution is 250 per month. We make 30 basis points on the credit card processing transactions, roughly 90 to 95% of most of these businesses are credit card versus cash. And then lastly, we make three, per, uh, three cents per text message, which is the industry standard for all the reminders. Um, we just started booking revenue in the test store. Last month, we, we banked uh, $432 with the current capabilities. And again, we talked about extending those uh, capabilities, um, similar to what Martin just talked about, into uh, future areas. Um, we'll get to three hundred thousand in ARR uh, with our with our core open stores um, by early next year. And as we look forward to just the hair and nails market in the U.S. Um, at 2,000 stores, which is really 3% of the market. It's about a $40 million business. Uh, the great thing about this is you can go to Canada and UK and Australia and all the US, Singapore, US uh, English speaking uh, countries and really expand the total addressable market with very low cost. Uh, in terms of the team, Shane Brown is a co founder of Unchained Systems as well as the chairman of. Diesel Barbershop, Henley's Gentleman's Grooming, and Cowboy Up. Um, he also owns a CPG company of hair products in this space. I'm Matt, in 25 years developing products for companies, including the last 11 at Apple, where I built omnichannel programs uh, that are used by millions of customers, including the immediate delivery program, iPhone trading program, and the uh, iPhone upgrade program. We own two diesel barbershops now with um, my wife is expanding out to six in the coming years. Harsh Shaw is the head of engineering and product. He's a lead, he's a, been in multiple venture backed startups with two exits. And to summarize, Amplify is a reoccurring revenue vertical SaaS business powering the original reoccurring revenue business haircuts. We're targeting franchisors and multi store owners in the personal services category. And we're extendable to other adjacencies in the future once we get this right. So spa, nails, acupuncture, et cetera. And you know, think about us as a vertical SaaS solution and fintech investment. We're raising $2 million on a $10 million valuation cap. Although based on some feedback from Martin, we may want to reconsider that. Uh, <laughs> we plan to raise the Series A next year. And with that, I'll take any questions. By the way, Martin and I did not conspire I, <laughs> on, on the topics here today. A lot of what he talked about was already built into my deck. So. Uh, thank you for teeing everybody up appropriately. Great. Thanks, Matt, for that. And Martin, what are you, we'll have you go first. And then we do have questions in the chat box. Martin, what questions did you have? Um, so, well, thank you for that. And uh, I, I really like what you're building. I mean, your, your example, you know, your chairman, you, you guys own a whole bunch of, of um, barber shops. You've 
ha experience the problems with the current solutions you built what you feel is a better solution that's like the perfect vertical market uh, software thing you've also you know gotten people like yourself and your uh, other technical engineer which come from real uh, software companies so you have a little more sort of technical chops than i've seen in a lot of these kind of uh, companies at this stage um you know my uh hesitancy on this particular one is that first of all i've seen probably 12 companies doing exactly this for exactly male uh, grooming uh, solutions over the last five years. So there's a lot of companies out there. I could send you a list. Um, none of them have gotten a material amount of uh, traction. And I think part of it is that one of the challenges here is that, um, you know, the, 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 there are pretty deeply embedded um, uh, old shitty businesses that I hate, like mind body, <laughs> um, which is a crappy business. I can't wait for somebody to disrupt them. The problem is they've got so many features and so much um, integration that you that that it's very hard to dislodge them. And you've got so so one problem is mind body. I'd like you to talk about how you uh, replace that. The second is that in a, in addition to mind body that has probably ninety percent share in these multi unit franchise things uh, in the United States, you've got these general purpose scheduling things like Booker.com, which um, you know is used by where I get my haircut, Weldon Barber. Uh, I agree with you that the UI is not so good between the the barber shop and the Booker thing, and it's not that awesome. But they have they started five or six years ago. They went into this grooming category, and they seem to have gotten a lot of traction on the booking side. So you're competing against. Um, full service platforms like MindBody and then other general platforms that do your category as well, like booker.com. And I'd like you to address sort of how you think you can compete with those two. It's great you have your own stores, but the challenge is gonna be how do you get to 10,000 stores, you know, 9,800 of whom you don't know yet. <laughs> I mean, certainly that's uh, appreciated feedback and, you know, We've talked, first of all, we, we evaluated MindBody ourselves many times, originally when it was Booker, then it was MindBody, and, um, you know, the platform has some serious challenges that, that we found, and <clears throat> as we talked to our peer group um, in both hair and massage, you know, the feedback is, we can't wait for another solution. It's Zenodi and MindBody owns 80, 90% of the marketplace. They do. And there's certainly challenges with both of them, although they've done a great job of building a big business. So we think that there's room for you know a new emerging partner. And because we're going to have the scale of 115 stores just with our own um our our own, I guess, <laughs> eating our own dog food, like I used to say at Microsoft, uh, we we have the ability to kind of tinker at scale that other businesses maybe don't have the luxury of doing. And um, the other thing is uh, the fees that are charged on credit card processing. If you're a single store, you know, charging 3% is probably fine. But if you're a franchise, that 3% is a, you know, is a material difference. So we believe that by getting the, you know, the rates down to in the, you know, two range, uh, that would be very attractive to um, you know, particularly franchisors and multi-store owners, who is our, our core segment. So uh, other than your own, I understand why you, you your own units are using your thing, but have you sold to closed anyone and gotten them off of mind body? Maybe it's this other uh, group that you mentioned, but I mean, what, what were the features that they wanted that got them to leave mind body? Cause I've, I, I've known mind body is shit for five years and it's, they still have 90% share. Yeah, I mean, we're not in the sales approach yet. We still have to finish building our platform. So we're about 60% complete. We plan to complete sometime later this year and go out to market in Q1. And we've got relationships with a handful of people that have some scale um, that want to see what we do and make sure that we prove it out, eat our own dog food before they consider cutting it over. But it's things like <laughs> the system goes down in the middle of the business day for 15 minutes is one of the feedbacks I hear 
you know, almost everyone I talk to. That's a pretty big deal <laughs> when you're in this category, when you're when you're working with retail. And so, you know, the stability of the solution is probably the most paramount. Credit card processing fees being another one. When I get my reminders on some of these platforms, it's in UTC time zone. So I get a reminder at 4 a.m., uh, which annoys me about the brand versus and the store. Uh, so, you know, just <laughs> again, these are not technical, super technical things. These are product oriented features that, you know, as a consumer of these, I just want it for my wife and my stores and my customers. And I believe that there's going to be others who are going to um, appreciate them as well. Okay. Is there, there was a couple other ones. I think I managed just to touch the first one or two. So that- we did have some questions from the chat box. Let me go ahead and run through them. It, first one is, are Premier paying a m- promotional monthly rate? Uh, so the... Are Premier paying, what is Premier? Uh, Premier Cuts? Uh, Premier yeah. Cuts is one of our investors, uh, one of our investors who has five stores and they're going to pay the the expected rate that um, any sort of business in their category would own. Um, so they're not on our platform yet. They're on they're on um, Zenodi, which is a competitor solution, but they okay. can't they can't right. wait to get off. Your your sale, what kind of discount uh, free period does a prospective customer get? So typically in this market, you're signing a two-year SaaS contract. So they basically sell it as the SaaS. And then usually the text messages are either bundled directly or indirectly. And then they don't disclose the credit card processing transaction, but they're making anywhere from 30 basis points. Once they get up to scale, they can sign up to become a payment facilitator and get close to 90 basis points, uh, which can be material once you got some scale. Great. Let's talk about your sales process. How many site visits and for how long? Well, we have, we've not started selling yet. These are really just with our extended network. Um, our intent is to start sales sometime next year in Q1. Okay. And can you talk about your competitors? We've talked a little bit about it, but what do you see as the competitive landscape there and what is your moat? Yeah, I mean, Martin's right. There's it's it's a huge, there, there's a number of folks out there. So Sunodi and MindBody are the biggest ones. Uh, there's Squire, who's done a good job at single barbershops and booth rental. Again, franchisor needs are a lot different than a single booth rental. Um, and uh, that's kind of the starting point. Uh, I see a note here. Why male only? I mean, men's grooming is where we're starting with, but female-oriented grooming, there's some minor amount of features that you would need to add to go into that marketplace as well. Um, overlapping appointments, for example, comes to mind functionality to do hair color dye, for example, again, minor uh, feature set, but still something to consider. Okay. Next one's 150 to $250 per month. Sounds very expensive, but I'm not in that industry. What do you think about that price or how did you choose that price? Um, the other one, so our quotes for Mind, Body, and Zenodi were anywhere from $400 to $1,000 a month. And so we think that we we can get a nice chunk of the market coming in and then that land and expand by adding value added capabilities like smart scheduling, labor management, um, you know, digital co-pilots to help optimize store operations. Okay, great. Uh, so next question is how would we get in touch with the speakers? We did run polls where people could do that, but if you uh, were not able to catch that, uh, I think Martin put his email into the chat box. Uh, Matt, if you could do the same thing, put your email in the chat box there. And so if somebody missed the poll, they can get back in touch with you directly. You can also contact Ken Capital, and we'll be glad to make an introduction there as well. So always a good thing to do there. Um, someone put in open table charges $250. Uh, so that's a good data point there as well. Uh, what do you think about you know comparing in at lower than open table, Matt? Uh, I mean, certainly that's more on the restaurant, uh, you know, and reservation space. I think the toast is all over the board, depending on how big your restaurant is and how much, um, you know, how much capabilities you've turned on and turned off. So that land and expand, get them in for a kind of a core piece, but then add uh, additional value adds um, based upon what the 
brands need is you know super important. And again, we're going to be eating our own dog food here, which is uh, at the end of the day, I have to come home to my wife and hear about what's working and not working. So I'm highly motivated to uh, optimize for <laughs> for needs since we've got two stores now and we'll have six in the coming years. Great. Well, it appears we're at the end of the questions. I want to thank you both guys for coming today. Matt, thanks so much for the presentation. Martin, thank you for your presentation on vertical SaaS. We see a lot of it out there. Do you have any thank closing you. comments, Martin? Uh, no, I don't. Like, if you guys are building anything interesting, um, you know, you have my email. Uh, hit me up. I'm uh, writing checks uh, every month these days. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you get both for coming today. I want to thank the audience. Great questions. Appreciate your joining us today. With that, we'll go ahead and close it out. We did have one last question. Um, uh, thanks for your presentation. I built in horizontal e-commerce CRM. You have given me some things to think about. So I think we're stirring people in the right direction. So that's a good thing. Okay. Thank All right, you. guys. Thank thanks you. so much and have a good one. We'll see you next time. Cheers. Bye-bye.